Hello, I'm your host, Ray Dogum, and welcome to Vibecast. Thank you for joining us as we explore the exciting advancements in technology-enabled collaboration to excel important drug development. VibeBio seeks to find every cure for every community. Join us to learn, imagine, question, and help us identify and develop solutions together. Our guests today are from Farron Pharmaceuticals, co-founder and CEO, Dr. Marku Jalkanen, and the company's chief Hello. medical officer, Dr. Marie-Louise Fialskog. How are you guys doing today? We are doing fine, thank you. Very good, thank you. Excellent, thank you for joining me today. You guys both have such rich backgrounds and important biopharma experience. Would you mind introducing yourselves to the listeners? And you can start with uh, Marku. Thank yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm really Farron's CEO and one of the founders. I do have a rather strong science background, uh, many years in the academic settings, but then started to feel that something has to be did, do those for those discoveries. And then I went to the biotech, and that's rather a usual pathway for the people who are like feel that the only way to help the people is really to convert the, the inventions into a drug candidates and then finally to the tracks. And I've been doing that for the last 20 years now. Maria Luis, you want to? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so hi everyone. So I'm Marie Louise Fialskog and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at Farron. I started my career as a cancer doctor and I've actually attended patients for the last 30 years. I've also been very interested in research and my personal research area has been to try to personalize therapy. I think it's really important that the patients get exactly the treatment that they need, not more and not less. The last 10 years I've been working in pharma and I have worked on the immune suppressive tumor microenvironment. So that means that many of our cancer drugs that we have today are not working because the cancer has found different ways of uh, hiding from the immune system. Uh, so that is the work I've been doing the last 10 years. And that is what I'm also doing at Farron. Excellent. Thank you both for sharing that context and background. Really appreciate it. And uh, so, you know, one of my questions to you both, since you have such great experiences, what does the oncology therapeutics landscape look like? And I know this has been an evolving space for decades, many decades now, of course. Um, and I just feel like very recently it's become so dynamic and vibrant. And I'd just like to get your perspectives on what you think of the, the landscape. One of the things what we have been missing is really try to utilize our own defense system really to attack the cancer and remove the cells. Somehow the cancer, being very smart, can take over our immune system and, and control that the way which will benefit their own growth and, and spread. And obviously we have made a significant uh, steps already by now having these immunology treatments where we can activate the immune cells called T cells. And that has been really helping a lot of people, but not all of us. And that is the missing link here, what we are really needing to solve, how we can actually control the immune suppressive elements in us in order to get full power out from these current uh, treatments, because only maybe roughly 20, 25% of the people are benefiting from them. And that has to be increased in order to be really being happy. And that has been the problem we are really trying to solve with the, with the product called Pex Marilimab. And, and that probably, hopefully, also opens a new ways of treating the cancer. Uh, and obviously that is the wish what we have at the Faron really very strong behind all the work we are doing at the moment. Are you awesome. want to we're going to dive into yeah. more about um, the, yeah. we'll dive in more into the drugs uh, in a little bit as well. Uh, Marie, Marie Louise, did you want to comment on that as well? Yeah, I can just say that as a medical oncologist, a cancer doctor, like the development of new drugs has been amazing the last 30 years. When I started as a doctor, there was like a handful of drugs that I could use to help the patients. Now there are so many new therapies, targeted therapies, and very, very exciting what Marco mentioned, the immunotherapies, where we actually can try to strengthen the patient's own immune system to help fight the cancer. And even though we have some breakthroughs, I think there is so much more to do in the immunotherapy space because with the current treatments, we have paid only about 20 to 30 patients percent of the patients do respond to therapy. And I think that there is lots more to be done here. So I really look forward to the continued development here. That's so exciting. Um, and, you know, can you mention what kind of cancer that Farron is trying to tackle? And while you do that, I'm also going to share the slides that you sent over so that can be 
visible to anyone on YouTube. If you're listening, you can always jump on YouTube. Yeah, thank you. This is really a focusing on the most exciting target we have at the moment. And this AML, acyl acute myeloid leukemia cell, looks very cancerous over there. These cells have a tendency to take over us as any leukemia. What the uh, mode of action here is showing to us is that we can activate our immune system and uh, with this uh, compound called Pexmerilimab is a humanized antibody. We have shown that in the a solid cancer patients already. But why this is so exciting that now the same target which we are activating on the surface of the monocytes of these myeloid cells who maintain this immune suppressive environment. We actually can also control the viability of these acute myeloid leukemia cells. So we have a twofold of, of new mode of action within, for these patients. Activate the immunity in them so that the immune system can really recognize and start to work against these cells and at the same time also reduce the viability of these cells. And that is the reason we believe is really the background reason why we are seeing so excellent results with the, with the current ongoing a, a study called Apex Map. And I'm, I'm happy really that Mary Louis is really presenting some of the results for us because that's, that's, so, that's so exciting at the moment. So thank you very much for sharing this slide. So I wanted to share some data from our BaxMap study. So in the beginning, I told you that there has been a fantastic development of drugs uh, since the, during the last 30 years. However, there is a very high unmet medical need in myeloid malignancies such as AML and MDS. So even though there are lots of new drugs being um, developed and approved, we need to have better drugs for these patients. In this BEXMAP study, which is a phase one, two study. So phase one, two means that we're looking at the safety and efficacy. We are looking at our drug, BEXMARILIMAP, that we have combined with standard of care in patients with myeloid malignancy. So these are different leukemias, MDS, AML. So the standard of care now is AZA site is a Dane? Correct. So we have one treatment arm in this study that we call the doublet. And that's where we have added our drug Bexmerilimab to standard of care azacitidine. So azacitidine is the standard of care in patients with MDS, frontline, patients with relapsed refractory ML, and also patients with MDS that already tried HMA-based therapy such as azacitidine. We also have a triplet combination, and there we have added back to the standard of care, azacitidine in combination with venetoclax in patients with newly diagnosed AML that do not tolerate chemotherapy. So if we go back to, to the study design, I just, yes, here we are. Uh, so we have very interesting data to share with you very soon on safety and efficacy. And based upon this data, even though this is a very comprehensive study that I shared with you, we are currently focusing on the doublet therapy. So we're focusing on patients that uh, will receive Bexmerilimab and azacitidine. And the patients that we focus on are patients that already had azacitidine and no longer has an effect of the therapy. I also wanted to share that enrollment is going really well into this study, and it just shows that more drugs, more combinations are needed for these patients. We have four sites in Finland that are doing fantastic. They are enrolling a lot of patients. The interest is very high, but we also think it's really important to enroll patients in the U.S. So we have City of Hope that is open in the U.S. They're enrolling very nicely. We also have MD Anderson, and MD Anderson is very important to us. Uh, the our global principal investigator for the whole study is Dr. Naval Davar, who is working at MD Anderson. We need even more sites in the U.S., so we are talking to Yale, UNC, and Fred Hutch, and they have agreed to come on board into this study to start enrolling patients later this year. So very exciting days for the continuation of the study. But I think I would like to go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the data that uh, we have seen. Sure. So 
in a phase one, two study, uh, you need to decide on the dose. So the phase one part is a dose finding. So we already know the dose of acecytidine because that is standard of care. But then we need with a new drug, we need to evaluate different doses of our drug, bexmerilumab, to see which dose is the best. And of course, we also need to look at the safety. So what I'm sharing with you here is three different doses of bexmerilumab evaluated together with uh, acecytidine, the standard of care. We started by evaluating bexmerilumab at one mg per keg dosed every week in five patients. Then we moved on to evaluate bex at three mg per keg every week in five patients that come under. And then the latest cohort that we have evaluated uh, is six mg per keg of bex dosed every week. So in total, we have safety and efficacy data from these 15 patients. I want to add that we have more patients ongoing in the study. So in a few months, we can share additional data. But anyway, the safety looks really good and safety is really important. We have already evaluated bexmerilumab as a single agent in a solid tumor study called METINS. And we saw that the safety was really good. Mostly we saw grade one to two events, so mild to moderate side effects. We did see some events with immune-related adverse events, which is important when you evaluate a drug that is actually immune activating. These events were very easy to solve by stopping the drug or adding steroids and the patients recovered. Now I want to go back to the combination data of safety and that also looks good. So we mostly see grade two, one to two mild to moderate adverse events with the combination. Anyway, let's go to the very exciting ex uh, um, data on the efficacy. Sure. So, Before we jump there, just really quick, the SD, the initials here at PR, can you just explain that? I mean, you might be just getting to it, but can you define that? Oh, thank Yes, of course. So what you see on these different bars here is the efficacy. So when it says SD, it means stable disease. So these patients were progressing. They were Their disease was getting worse when they came into the study. But with study treatment, the patient's disease has stabilized. So that's what SD means. PR means partial response. So that means that the patients are responding, but there is still some signs of cancer. And if we look at the CR, that's what everyone wants. That's a complete remission. So that shows that the cancer cells in the bone marrow, what we call the blasts, they are no longer there. The bone marrow is normalized. And then some patients also have a complete recovery of the blood counts, which is really important in these patients. And some patients have a partial recovery. So SD, stable disease, PR, partial response, CR, complete reduction of the blast in the bone marrow. But if we go back to the efficacy data, if we look at the first five patients in the first cohort that we dose, one with per kg, we see that, oh, sorry, we see that three patients out of five had an objective response. And objective response means that you can actually measure it and you can, it's not just like you feel like they are better. You can actually say that we can see objectively that there is a response. In the second cohort, we had two patients out of five patients with objective responses. And very, very excitingly, in the six mg per kg cohort, the last cohort that we evaluated, we have three patients with objective responses. So this is just a dose escalation study, so we're finding the dose, but still the efficacy looks amazing. So we have 15 patients treated and eight out of these patients, more than half, are actually having objective responses. We are combining drugs, so then it can be difficult to say how much is actually bexmerilumab, our drug, adding to this efficacy. But four, four or five patients of, of all of these patients that responded actually have received the standard of care, acecytidine, before. And we already know that acecytidine does not help these patients anymore. 
So in these patients, when we see an effect, we know that it's highly likely that baxmarilumab has added to the effect. So you can say that from a clinical point of view, at least four or five of these patients, we have clinical proof that Bax is helping those patients. So I think this is very, very exciting, and it's very rare to see those fantastic efficacy data already in a dose find. Yeah, that's, that's really incredible. And so this is, phase, this is a phase two study here that you're displaying, right? Uh, what are your plans for the next phase of trials? Yes, so you may think that this is a phase two study because I'm talking so much about efficacy. I really understand that. It's actually the phase one part of the study. So the most important thing is to look at the safety, which I shared like uh, verbally. But then, of course, for these patients, it's also very important to show that we can help them to improve their disease. So this part of the study is actually the phase one part of the study. But we are looking at going into the phase two part of the study very soon. So uh, we need to decide on two doses to move forward with. So the health authorities are now very interested in reducing the toxicity of drugs. So the health authorities demand that you choose two different effective doses to move forward with in the phase two part of the study to evaluate which drug is the best or which dose is the best and where do you see the least safety signals. So in the phase two part of this study, which I hope will start by the end of the year, we're going to evaluate two different doses in one indication. When we have looked a little bit more of these two different doses, we will decide on the most effective dose and the safest dose to move forward with. So a lot of things going on. We're really hoping to open the phase two part of the study soon and to help as many patients as possible. Excellent. Yeah. And that makes sense because you had 15 uh, subjects here in the study. So that's a phase one. Uh, and phase two, do you have an, an idea of how many subjects you would like to have recruited? So, so the current plan, uh, and of course, we need to, to await input from the FDA, but we, we do believe that in the phase two part of the study, we would have approximately maybe 60 patients. And then to really come in the, in the confirmatory part of the study, we may need around 100 patients. Around. But that is preliminary data based upon our own internal discussions. And of course, we need input from the health authorities. Excellent. And which health authorities are you working with? Um, I, you having, you know, being based in Finland, um, what regulations are you uh, obligated to follow? So we are following the Finnish health authorities uh, uh, regulations and also FDA's regulations. So right now we have two health authorities uh, moving forward. If the data continue to look as good as they are, we need to open much more sites. And that would expand into other countries in Europe as well. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. One question I have is, how is Farin actually uh, differentiated from others in the marketplace today? It's a really good point, And thank you for asking. The, the immune activation is very popular. And we know that it's very crowded. And there are a number of products already in the market. But they target mainly these T cells, like I indicated earlier, cells that already are there. But if you are totally silent and you don't have any immune activation taking place, they are not there that can be actually act on, on cancer cells. And by igniting the immunity, we can help the body really to create new line of defense uh, against the cancer antigens. And, and that's what we have been looking for for quite a long time. And, and now it's really starting to pay off because if you saw the results, they are really excellent on the efficacy wise. And, and, and really would like to move on with, with the AML uh, as soon as possible. And we do have a plan that we would actually file the marketing application already in the first half of 25. But then it comes also to the combination possibility with the current immunology products. Because if we can really ignite the immunity, we can then think that the combination with the current immunotherapies could help those who have a negative response at the moment. And that is a really significant population of the cancer patients and, and we would like to also show that in the future trials but we are now really focusing to this AML at the moment. So novel target, novel uh, cell, uh, cell type uh, macrophages, immunosuppressive creators uh, and really we are the only 
company at the moment who are working with the clever. Interesting. Uh, so, you know, one thing that Vibio likes to focus on when talking to biotech companies is what stage of the company that you're at, like what are your critical inflection points? And we sort of discussed, you know, your next critical inflection point or one of them is beginning phase two trials and eventually getting data from those trials. Um, are there other specific inflection points you're considering today um, that you find would be worth sharing that are important for Farron? Yes, there are. And, and that actually goes to the commercial side very easily because obviously also other companies have realized that if they want to have a competitive position in the immunology area, they also need new tools. And obviously we are very happy to negotiate with the big pharma or other companies really for all kinds of collaborations. And, and that could be a significant really a milestone for us within the next 12 or months. And, and, and you never know the outcome because it's, it's obviously a new target, a new mode of action, and people may be critical at the beginning, but once you start to get the results, what Mario Luis just showed, their interest is really increasing at the same time. So not only the pipeline progress, but also the commercial side would be really important for us. Excellent. Yeah, and in science, and especially in oncology, the data speaks very loudly when you have it. So I think that's super important to have. Um, and one other thing, so there's many different ways biotech companies can raise money. One way they can raise money is, like you said, partnerships with larger pharmaceutical companies where they can arrange for different types of milestone payments, et cetera, with a, a conjoined uh, agreement. Another way is they can also uh, elect to go public and file for an IPO. So um, very different strategies, um, pros and cons on both sides, I'm sure. But um, just thinking about because um, this company is a public company, what would you say are some milestones that maybe a earlier stage biotech company should achieve before deciding to do an IPO, for example? Well, we all know that the markets are rather tough at the moment. Um, there are some signs of, of increasing activities and hopefully really takes place. Uh, at the, today's conditions, I feel that you may need to have a good clinical results before you really want to do it. And then obviously, if you have some con good investors in, in, your, in your shareholders, you actually make them really to back up also that plan and that combination is probably the best and easiest way out. Uh, but good results, nothing beats good data. That's, that's just the fact and, and it really helps go to the market. Excellent. Um, maybe, uh, you know, just curious because there might be a lot of biotech founders or scientists that are early on in their career. Could you share some advice for aspiring scientists or maybe even doctors who are interested in pursuing a career in biotech research and development? Research is very interesting area and, and my own curiosity against the human behavior has been really through my career. And learning biology is, is really important, but to convert the invention into a product, uh, you know, first drug candidate and hopefully then later on even drug, that requires experience. So whoever wants to dream of becoming a biotech person should really try to learn that from the past and the people who have been involved. There's no classes or schools who actually can teach you to do this. You really have to go and do it by yourself, but try to look at a good environment where you can learn those. And, and, and I have been lucky enough of getting in, in those situations in my, my career. And, and I think Maria Louise has been the same. And so, Talk to the people, really learn to respect the opinions, be critical from time to, time to time, but try to progress all the time. This is not an impossible area. I, I know it may be challenging and you, you have failures, but you, you learn to tolerate those as well. You got to persevere through the failures, that's for sure. Uh, especially in this industry, there are many failures. Uh, most drugs fail, actually. So. Um, you know, it makes sense to be strong and thick skinned in that sense. Correct. Um, Mary Louise, did you have anything else to add to advice for doctors or scientists that are aspiring? 
No, I just feel like it's really important to know all the rules and regulations to because we're talking about treating patients and safety is important and so on. But when you know the rules and regulations, I think it's really important to be innovative, to think outside of the box. So I think you need to combine those two. And I can just say that I love working in this industry. I think it's extremely exciting and I hope more people should join. Excellent. Love that response. I appreciate it. Um, so I just wanted to thank you both again, marie Louise and Marco, for joining me today on Vibecast and talking about uh, the updates from your company. And you know, we're looking forward to hopefully good results for you guys and the patients as well, most importantly, because all right. you know, with all these new technologies, the most important thing is focusing on how this is going to impact patients and their, their families and communities. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience before we conclude here today? I just want to say that that's the biggest motivation we have is really to help the people. You know, diseases, uh, especially leukemia, we have a tremendous unmet need there. So we work hard really to help the people. Thank you. Excellent. I completely echo that. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate your time. Mm -hmm.